Welcome everybody to lecture four, information retrieval in the summer semester 22-23. We've prepared another fascinating lecture for you. I hear you, thank you. Uh, I say it every time because it's true. We will talk about the third exercise sheet, which was a efficient list intersection, which was a theoretical sheet, yay. And today we will talk about compression. You will learn a lot about compression. It's again a, a mathematical lecture with a practical application. The sheet will again be mathematical. I will show you a lot of things, but it's a nice mathematics. I will have a survey at some point, and if you want to participate, you should be uh, logged into Zoom. So maybe in the background while listening to me, if you have a device with you, you can just, so that you can take part in the survey, just log into Zoom. The link is on the wiki, right? You can just, of course, you should uh, set loudspeaker, microphone and everything to off. Here's the meeting link. It will take a while before we get there, but so you can already prepare. Okay, so experiences with the third exercise sheet. So some of you love math, maybe one third or so. Some of you struggle with it, a few more struggle, a bit more struggle than love. Okay, and uh, here are some quotes. I really like that the sheet was more mathematical. Actually, I enjoy this more than coding, so just that you know that such people also exist. It was a different experience than the last two sheets. I hope to not experience this ever again. So there was a certain spectrum. Need to brush up on my math skills. A lot of people wrote that. And I always try to be representative, which was, so uh, there were um, several comments in this vein. No major issues, several people wrote that, but LaTeX for the first time, you need it anyway later, so why not start now? I noticed the hint on the, I hear you talking, I noticed the hint on the exercise sheet was not as exciting as usual. I don't know, did you look closely because it was in this very special handwriting font, which actually took more time than usual to print on my machine. So yes, also it was more work than usual. We have several people who want to become teachers or study something that goes towards becoming teachers. And in the spatula poly, poly because you study two subjects, apparently there is no math in the curriculum, which is some of you pointed out a design error, and if you really had no math lecture so far, then doing proofs is a, a little hard. Yeah, Sorry for that. <coughs> Handwriting, some comments. Computer scientists are used to run algorithms as time efficient as possible. Writing is an algorithm. Very matter of factly. Several of you wrote something in that vein. It's not required to be a computer scientist. I don't care enough to improve it. Okay. Interesting, sexism in 2022 is still very real, I agree. Girls get peer pressured into having to write nicely, boys get shit for having girly handwriting. Interesting. Yeah. Computer scientists have bad handwriting because they are not doctors. Doctors have worse <laughs> handwriting. So <laughs> there's a Dijkstra had a mesmerizing handwriting as far as I know. It's true. Let me see if this link works. Edska Dijkstra, one of the few European Turing Award winners, he made a point of uh, writing. Uh, this is not a font, it's his handwriting, and he was very proud of it. He was a very special personality, so very strong personality, very opinionated also, also a bit obsessive. So some, and there is, a, here's some other guy, uh, some Dutch guy, I think, also, and they had kind of a strange relationship. I think he scolded him at first for his bad handwriting, then he went on to, so this is his PhD thesis, which, so, yeah, we're thinking of introducing similar standards for, for this faculty, so <laughs> I think it's a nice idea to write your PhD thesis like this. It's amazing, right? But he didn't start out to get uh, have a nice handwriting, but then Dijkstra gave him shit and then he improved and he was also, he also had a 
difficult personality and it's a quite a story behind it if you want to read the story behind this guy he eventually committed suicide unfortunately because it was a very strange very strange story They're very special personalities these two Dijkstra and this other guy so help with mathematics now I hope many of you have logged in then I can uh, ask my survey. So some of you have what I like to call math phobia. And uh, yeah, maybe some of you want help with it, maybe some of you don't. So uh, we would like to know how we can help you. It's an ongoing topic for computer science students. So there, there is a question on the exercise sheet. You can also answer it uh, anonymously if you want, but uh, as you like. Here's one point, and then I'm going to ask my survey, and you have enough time to answer it. Math is easier than you think. I think a lot of, and that's why I like to call it phobia, it's about barriers in the head which somehow originated at some point in your life. And as, as it is with barriers, they appear very large, but I don't know, they started out maybe small, and then they stay there. And if something stays for a long time, Sometimes people accept it as a given, but actually it might be possible to just overcome it. And here's an example which I like to give, which I think is a great example for, for the point I'm trying to make here. There are many aspects, but I think that's one important aspect. Assume you have mastered the four basic arithmetic operations. And I think most of you in this room have like three plus five, eight. You have no problems with that. Four minus seven, minus three. Okay, negative numbers, a little bit more difficult. Multiplying numbers, dividing numbers. And then you can put things into parentheses. So it's just four operation and you can put things in parentheses. So give a different priority. <coughs> And now you get this expression, and now you are the master of arithmetic expression, <coughs> of arithmetic operations. And I'm asking you, if you as the masters of arithmetic operations, does this formula frighten you? You have to solve this now. You, maybe your life depends on it, or you get a million dollars if you solve it, but you have as much time as you like. Does this formula frighten you? Point is, not really, right? You look at it and you say, yeah, that's work. I have to be careful not to make a mistake. I have to double check three times. But just because it's complex and you need some time doesn't mean it's hard, right? You realize, oh, it's just 12 minus 3 is 9. I have to multiply with 7, 63, and so on. So you just do it one after the other. And my claim is that a lot of mathematics, maybe even all of mathematics, and certainly all of mathematics and computer science, is just of this kind, right? And I think what happens with many people is they see formulas, <laughs> and there's sub i, an index, and then maybe there's a superscript, and then there's li, and di, and an epsilon, and then you get this, wow. And, and it's like, but if you know the basics, like the basic operations, and there are very few operations, so actually mathematics is something for lazy people, but you don't have to learn so much, then, then it's just as not frightening as this uh, formula. So I think that's, that's an important point. So if it frightens you, maybe it helps you to realize that what's behind this is just the very few things which you have to understand. Once you understand them, even complex things, you can, you can break them down. And they're actually not so hard. It looks hard because of complexity, but not... Yeah. So, oh no, you are locked in. Ah, that's uh, strange. I tried the polling and now I can't do it anymore, but I will try something else. I will try to give... That's really strange, because I... Let me try to start it from this device. Maybe I can start it from... Mm -hmm. Ah, we can start it from here. Do you see the poll now? It's about mathematics. 
You see it? Great. Take your time, just do it as a background job and we'll come back to that later. Okay, so ten, the ten introductory minutes are over and we just start with our topic today. And uh, while I do, yeah, maybe you can reserve 30% for listening and the rest for... So we are talking about uh, compression, thank you Frank. Motivation for compression. Inverted lists can become very large. So what's the length of an inverted list? That's how we started. It's the total number of occurrences of that word in the collection, depending on how exactly you do it. A word occurs in a document, you have an entry in the inverted list. So in a web scale collection, and here are some numbers actually about a uh, number of websites indexed by Google. Uh, so they were proudly presented it on their website in the beginning. At some point they stopped. Actually, I said that in the first lecture, it's not so much increasing anymore. It's more about quality than about quantity. But initially, uh, yeah, it was a challenge to increase this. So, yeah, so very long lists. So here are some single, if you type a single keyword query on Google, maybe let's just do that together. Google actually gives you a hint at the length of the, no, I didn't want algorithmus, something to eat, I want algorithm. So algorithm, 851 million results. So that's kind of the length of the inverted list Google has for algorithm. And it's interesting because when I did this two days ago, it was this number. So apparently it depends on the machine and yeah, a lot of personalization going on. That's really interesting. Okay, here are some other, so this is some real numbers, I tried it two day days ago. Also, let's try AND. With AND I get 25,270,000 million, so 25 billion, 270 billion. Let's type, try the word THE. I get 25 billion, 270 million. Looks suspiciously similar, so apparently Google is not giving you the exact size of their it's probably just the number of things they have indexed divided by two or something like that. I guess that's what they are doing, kind of using Zipf's law to approximate these numbers because maybe they don't have the size of the whole list or they don't want to give it to you. The point of this slide is just to get started and to tell you that these lists for, for real data can be really large, so we, you want absolutely to talk about compression now, of course, you have to store these things. It's a list of integers, so you want to save space. But the great thing about compression is that it does potentially not only save space, but also time. And let me explain that to you on the next slide so by an example. Let's assume the index is on a hard disk. Hard disk, these are these rotating disks from ancient times, but you still have them for a reason. You will see and they are still used, we still use them for our very large data projects. Here's an example. Let's assume you have such a hard disk, they are very cheap, that's why they are good and in use. Takes, let's say, 50 megabyte per second. If you just read from it one byte after the other, you can read with 50 megabyte per second. Let's assume you have an algorithm which compresses stuff by a factor of five, like 100 gigabyte become 20 gigabyte. Let's assume this algorithm can decompress at a speed of 33 megabyte per second, meaning you have 33 megabyte compressed. If you take it, then you can decompress it in one second. That's, so that's the size of the compressed data. And now let's say we have a 50 megabyte inverted list. It's just ins, takes 50 megabytes, and we want to read it from this. So what if we read it in uncompressed, it takes one second. Right? This is our disk transfer time, it's 50 megabyte on disks. We read it, one second. Let's say it's compressed on disk. So it's compressed, which means by a factor of five, it's just 10 megabytes on disk. So instead of in one second, I can read the disk compressed data in a fifth of the time, in 0 0.2 seconds. And now these 10 megabytes, I have to decompress them. This takes another 0 0.3 seconds, but not so much also because it's compressed. So together, reading it compressed much faster, I need a bit of time for decompressing, half a second. So 
it's actually faster. It's not just less, not just that I saved a factor of five on disk, it also took me only the half the time to uh, read to read it. And that's a major factor when you... Uh, yeah, this is often the bottleneck in search engines. We can say that from experience, We're getting the data from disk if you have very large data. And then you wonder if you have, uh, we have seen these algorithms which skip stuff, um, and if you have, yeah, you can also skip, uh, one can skip uncompressed parts, I would say uh, one can skip compressed parts without uncompressing, right? Maybe you have some pointers in there which tell you this whole sequence, you, you don't even have to look at it, just jump over it, then you don't even have to decompress it. What about solid state drives and RAM, so memory? So here the transfer rates, how fast you can read, are much larger. So for a hard disk, like a rotating disk, it's 50 to 100. For SSD, these are just some ranges, approximately, right? For RAM, it's even faster. You can read with 4 to 20 gigabyte per second. Then this trick does not work so well anymore because, I mean, what's the typical decompression? Because yes, now you can read much faster if it's compressed, but now you have to decompress it and that also takes time. So I tried it yesterday, decompression speed of gzip, for example, is around 50 megabytes per second. So if you have these faster media, it will not be faster if you combine the two, but just to state the obvious, if you compress the data, uh, then you can fit things into RAM or on your solid state drive, which otherwise you couldn't. So it still pays, right? So you, you have, have it on this faster medium, whereas if you don't compress it, it's too large. And why don't you just buy more RAM or more solid state drive without compressing? Well, here are some prices. Hard disk, one terabyte, costs about 25 euro. So dirt cheap. SSD, four times as expensive. So this is uh, quality disks, not some. <laughs> and a terabyte of RAM is incredibly expensive. 5,000 is probably not even enough. So, so that's uh, why people still use solid disks. Okay. Okay, I will go to the survey at the end of this part. So, so how do we make use of this? Here's one observation. L this is inverted lists, how we had them. So integers, and I omitted uh, other stuff here, like scores or positions or what, what not. So integers in increasing order. So here's an obvious trick. So if you store it like we did it so far, everything is an int, which uses four, typically eight bytes. But you use eight bytes to represent the number three, right? That's a bit uh, wasteful. So here's an obvious trick. You just store the differences. From beginning to 3, it's plus 3. From 3 to 17, it's plus 14. And you can imagine, if this is a large inverted list and everything is in sorted order, these gaps will be small numbers. So you have a lot of small numbers, a few larger numbers. This is called gap encoding, very obvious and simple idea. When does it work? Well, it works as long as you go through the list from left to right. And it doesn't matter whether you have it in this format and or in that format, right? You can, if you go here, you can just sum it up, you get the real numbers. And that's what one does. What doesn't work if you want random access, so if you want to know, give me the doc, uh, element, the ID at position one million, then here it wouldn't work. You would have to sum up these numbers here. Uh, but very often you just go through from left to right. All our algorithms did something like this. With jumping you need additional tricks. So, so if you do this simple trick, now you have a sequence of mostly, not always, small numbers. You have a lot of small numbers, some large numbers. How do you store numbers where you know something about the distribution, like many small ones, a few large ones, how do you store them efficiently? That's the topic of the lecture. And let's just look at why, why isn't it obvious? Well, let's just look at the, and let's uh, just verify here, maybe the, here's some binary representation of the, we always start with one, so, uh, yeah. So the integers, the binary representations, let's just check What's, because we need that number later, 
that it's really locked to typical exam question, by the way, so if you prepare for the exam, wh what's the exact length of the binary uh, representation of number x, you have to figure out, okay, it's probably log something, log to which base, yeah, it's log 2 because it's binary representation, do I round up, do I round down, is it plus 1? A simple way to do it, I mean, there are not so many possibilities, you round up or down, then you have to add 1 or not, you can just try it out and see which one works, so let's just do it here, so if I do log two of, uh, that's the number one, log two of one, round it down, log two of one is zero, round it down uh, is zero, plus one is one, so that's uh, correct. Let's check this here, the logarithm of two, now we are at number two, so it's two, log two of two is uh, one, plus one is two, that's also correct, you need uh, two bits to represent the number two, and now you see why rounding down is correct. Now you are not yet at the next power of two, so it's log two of three, rounding down, so it's the same, it's one, only if you get to the next power of two, four, it would be two, and it's true, if you go from two to three until you hit the next power of two, you don't need more bits, so it makes sense, so that's when you always have the rounding down and so on. Yeah. So just that you have, so it's, it's something log 2 of x and this is the correct uh, formula. So, this encoding is, is optimal in a sense, that's an interesting question, so is, can we do better, can, are there shorter codes, I mean this is one way to encode it, we could give any codes, <laughs> the whole uh, rest of the lecture will be about this. But there's another problem, so, so let's just use this representation, it's kind of the shortest binary representation of a number, it always starts with a 1, because you don't write the leading zeros, and now let's just use this for gap encoding. So here, plus 3, it's 1, 1, plus 14, plus 4, so these are the binary representations, I concatenate them, perfect. If this would work, then we would be finished for today, why doesn't it work? What's the problem? Do you see a problem with this approach? Yeah? Uh, we don't know where one uh, number starts. Mm. Exactly. Like yeah, we don't know. I mean, I could now draw boundaries here with my pen, but on the computer you can't draw boundaries. So you just have a bit sequence, you don't know. Okay, is my first thing a 1, a 3, a 7? And actually, yeah, here's an example on the next slide. So if we just take this exact sequence, it could be this, it could be this, depends on, yeah. And, and when you think about it, what's the problem here? Why is it not, uh, why is it ambiguous if you go from left to right? There are even, there are a lot of possibilities, interesting exercise, how many possibilities are there? Why? Why is it ambiguous if you go from left to right? It's ambiguous exactly for one reason, because you have codes that are prefixes of other codes. That's exactly the reason. So there's a code 11, which is the number 3, and 111, which is the number 7, and this is the prefix of this. So if you encounter 11, you just can't know, know is it 3 or is, is will this continue as 7. And that's, so and this is something to think about, I will not prove it today, it's, actu it's actually an uh, interesting exercise, or maybe, who knows, an exam question. So in a prefix-free code, and this is not a prefix-free code, no code is a prefix of another, and this is equivalent to saying that decoding from left to right is ambi unambiguous. So, yeah. So if you want, just sit down afterwards or any time when you prepare for the exam, try to prove that this is exactly the same thing. Unambiguous encoding from left to right and prefix freeness. But here is an example. Okay. And uh, I think now is time to show the result of the poll. I'm curious myself. End poll share results. Do I also get the results? No. 
I don't see them. Interesting. I have to look. I love mathematics. Five percent. Hmm. Really. Interesting. It's okay. Ah, we don't see it here on the... But Ah, you don't see it there. That's a pity. And I don't see it because I'm the... Hmm. Who sees it on their device now in the room? Okay, those of you with a device. Okay, I'm sorry. That's because I can't launch it here, but because I'm host on this device, I can't see the result. I will just tell you what the result is. I love mathematics and I had no problems with ES3, 5%. It's okay, it needs some time, but I get by without help. 40%. I struggle a bit, but with enough time and effort, I can do it. 33%. I struggle quite a bit and would like help to improve. 18%. I don't really care. <laughs> 5%. Okay, love and I don't care, 5%. So we have this kind of a normal distribution. I think it's a very interesting result. Thank you. And uh, what's most interesting for us, okay, there, there's a comment that, yeah, not all the options were covered. I agree. A, a survey is always uh, discretizing in unfair ways. That's why we have a question at the end of exercise sheet four, where you can give us more information, a free text answer. This was just to get, get an idea. So most interesting for us, interesting for what can we do to help is of course the category I struggle quite a bit and I would like help. So especially for you, please tell us when you give your feedback for the fourth exercise sheet how we can help you. Because uh, that seems to me the, uh, yeah, how can we help you? If you have problems and you want help. If you have problems and you don't care, we can't help you. I think that's obvious, but 20% want help and we want to help. Okay, so now the rest of the lecture is about codes, prefix free codes. Because this code, which is great, it's the best code, but it's not prefix free, so we can't use it. And let's start. Yes, please. Okay, by prefix I mean, it's on the slides, but maybe it was a little bit fast. You look at all the codes. So this year, if you continue this list, one is one code, it's the code for the number one. One zero is the code for the number two. And the question is, is one of these codes a prefix of another? Uh, okay. Do you have a pair of codes where one is a prefix of another? And yes, here you have a lot of pairs. One is a prefix of one zero zero zero. So this is not a prefix free code. And we will see exactly right now an example of a code where this is not the case and then it will become even clearer. Right, you. Yeah, you're welcome. So here's Elias Gamma. A code, an old code from actually not so hard, but yeah, you just have to start early enough with inventions and it's always easy. So let's just look at the first two numbers, and it's written here how this code works. One, two, three, four, and let's maybe also do the number 10. And here's a simple idea. The question is how do you construct prefix free codes? And we will see a lot of them in the following, a lot of codes. So what you do is first you write log two x rounded down zeros. And then you write the number in binary like we have seen it before. So what's log 2 of x here? It's a 1, 0. So log 2 of 2 rounded down. No, it's no 0. I'm sorry. Log 2 of 1 is 0. You don't actually write any 0. Let me maybe start with the number 2 where I write 1, 0. And now I write the number 2 in binary. And number 2 in binary, maybe I write it in another color, maybe in wonderful green, one, zero. This is now the Elias code for the number two, zero, one, zero. When you store it, you store it without colors, because there's no way to store a colored bit, just, <laughs> just in case you want it. It's just for illustration purposes. So three, log two of three rounded down, it's also a zero, and now you write three in binary. Let's do the four. 
Now the four uh, is, uh, you have two zeros, and now you write the four in binary. One, zero, zero. And now it's your turn, ten. First tell me how many zeros. For number ten, how many orange zeros? Three. Yeah, that's true, because eight, and then from eight to fifteen is three. So you see these numbers don't become so large very quickly. And what's the binary representation of 10? So it's a, oh no, that's the wrong color. Then it's not Elias Gamma if you write it in blue. How many bits is it? Four bits. So it's one, zero, one, zero. Yeah, it's one, two, four, eight, two and eight. And there you have it. And what's Elias Gamma for the number one? We left this one for the end. And, and what color? Green. Yeah, that's correct, because you don't have. And now let's verify that this is prefix-free, at least for these examples. Is there any code here that's a prefix of another code? And think about why, why that is the case. And uh, it's actually harder to understand why is no uh, code the prefix of another. It's easier to understand why is it unambiguous. If I ask you the question, why is it unambiguous if I go from left to right? Why do I know when the code ends? What would be your explanation? If I now have a sequence of Elias Gamma codes, I start somewhere, I know now comes the Elias Gamma codes, how do I know where it ends without boundaries drawn in my... Because the same uh, pattern is not repeated in any other... Uh, okay, the same pattern is not repeated. Can you try to make it more precise? Why? If you are the algorithm now, and you are now seeing a bit sequence, and you know now comes an Elias Gamma code, how do you know when to stop? Uh, yeah? Yeah, so after lock two zeros, I just get a number for lock two plus one bits, and then yeah. you know that number ends there. Yeah, that's correct. So you just read how many zeros until the first one. The binary representation starts with a one always because it's like the shortest binary representation. So you just read. So even if they're not orange, you know how many orange there are because you just read until the first one. Now you know three. And now the rest is just three plus one because x in binary is just this number plus one. So that's why it's unambiguous. So a very simple idea and it works. Now. Oh, oh, what have I done? I have, uh, yeah, this is the code length. You can easily figure this out. I didn't realize there was a, but uh, yeah, let me just do some PowerPoint magic here. And here's the, I used to have a slide on this, but uh, I just dropped it because maybe you can imagine it. Now you can do something called bootstrapping. You can do it for fun if you like afterwards, which means applying something to itself. If you take these orange, what you do with the orange zeros is you're encoding a number in, bar in unary, right? This is encoding the number three by just writing three zeros followed by a one. And if you just take this whole thing, the three zeros followed by a one, this is now the number three which you're encoding here, and now you don't encode it like this, but you use Elias Gamma to encode it. So you take this prefix part, this is the number four, and now you write the Elias the Gamma code for number four here. And if you do that, then you get shorter codes. There will be log plus log log and so on. And this is called Elias del Delta. And this you can iterate and iterate. At some point you get Elias Omega, but that's more for theoretical fun. So then you can get close to log to the optimal log two. So you don't want a factor of two here. But it's a rather theoretical scheme, so I'm just mentioning it on the side. Here's one, Gollum. Here's Gollum. Uh, and that's the one uh, important for the exercise sheet. It comes with a parameter, M, called modulus. So that's one way to do it. There are a lot there. 
so many coding schemes. It's a lot of fun to think about one yourself and I think there's still room for coming up with another one. I have another slide on what coding schemes there are around. So let's look at this one. It's also quite famous. And let's, uh, let's do it by an example. Let me check how much space I have here. Or let, let's take a yeah, let's take an example. For example, mm -hmm. yeah, let's take an example here. Example. Let's take a number. Let's say our modulus is 16, and you will see in a second what that means. And our number is, yeah, let's take 42. That's a nice number. And now, What's the code? And now let's first write the, uh, yeah, let's first, we also have some Q in urinaries with zero, and let me maybe use, uh, how many, okay, first I need to do some, I haven't explained it, but I will explain it now while I compute it for this example. We are computing the modulus and the, yeah, how, how often 16 fits inside this. Let's just compute it. Q is, Q is, so div, you have this operation on, on machines, but it's just dividing and then rounding down. So that's 42, I'm sorry, 42 t divided by 16 rounded down. So how, how often does 16 fit into 42? And what's the answer? Hmm? Three, yes. Thank you for paying attention. It's two, exactly. And what's the remainder? Yeah, the remainder is 10, so that's uh, 42 modulo 16, and that's 10. So what you do now, so the number is, you'd write the Q as leading zeros, so you have zero, zero. And how many, let's write while we are doing it, how many are these? These are exactly, how many bits? It's exactly uh, x over m bits, right? Now we write a single one. Let's do this in maybe in wonderful lila. That's one bit. And we do that, uh, you will see in a second why we do that. So let we need a one here as a delimiter so that we know when the zeros end. And now let's write this in binary. We use the color green for this. And this is now fixed length. So we know the modulus is 16, so we can just always do it in log to m bits. So modulo m, it goes from 0 to m minus 1. How many bits? So this is not uh, an integer number. Do I have to round it up or round it down if I want to fit the numbers from 0 to m? So here it's uh, exactly a power of 2. So if m is 17, is it log to m rounded up or rounded down? Do I need four or five bits to run? Hmm? Up or down? Up. Yeah, you need up, exactly. You need up, down is because you have, then maybe you're wasting some bits, but otherwise you don't have enough bits. So that's a fixed size. So here it's uh, four bits. And what's 10 in binary? We have already seen that. It's one, zero, one, zero. And now, and you write that this is a uh, fixed width, right? So this part, let me just go to the pointer mode. This is always four bits, so you could also have for the number zero, 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 zero here, or for the number three, zero, zero, one, one. This is now fixed length representation, which doesn't always start with a one, which is why you need the one here, so that you know Unary representation only makes sense if you know where it ends, right? So that's the code. So the total code length 
we can write that up here, code, code length for code for number x, and think about whether you have any questions. So the code length, and that's important for the exercise sheet, for a code for number x with modulus m, and this modulus is just a parameter, is yeah, it's just this, you divide this, this is the number of zeros, plus one, plus, yeah, this is just how many bits you need. Is there any question about Gollum encoding? Yes? I'm not sure why we need the, uh, the limit The one? Why we need the one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the green one is a fixed length and it can be anything. So here you can have all f 16 combinations from 000, zero, zero to, okay. yes. <laughs> because the remainder can be anything. So just take all the numbers from, if you have a 2 here, which means we have 32. Yeah, from 32 to, 30 to 48, I guess, then you get then you have zero, zero, 001 and then you will have all the combinations here. So you need the one to figure it out. Any other questions here or on the chat about column encoding? Okay, we have one more. There are many more. Oh yeah, there's another question, yes? I have a question. The M yeah. is a is something that we choose ourselves. Yeah, it's a fixed parameter. So like there are many Gollum encodings and this is the Gollum encoding for M equal to 16. It's not something which you can vary. You say, okay, I want the code for m equals to 16. And is there like a, a reason why you would choose one over the other? Oh, that's a very good question. I would say that's what the whole exercise sheet is about. <laughs> it's exactly the question for why in the second part of the lecture we will have some theory, because the question is, what do I choose? Do I choose Elias? Do I choose Gollum? Which m? Exactly. These are the, the quick questions. So how do I, which one do I choose, which parameter? And here's another one. It's called variable byte encoding. And this is, uh, this is actually quite important in practice. If you uh, think about these schemes, and let me go to one of the slides where I had a bit sequence. I'm not, I'm just sorry only a matter of hours. Here I have a bit sequence, or here, and now I want to decode this, and it could be this, for example, and let's say I could figure out that it's this. Now, <laughs> I mean, I need to extract, if I want to go from here, let's say I know that it's this representation to here, now I need to extract two bits, extract them, turn them into number three, then extract the next four bits, and so on. So I have to and, and things are stored as ints, so I have to extract bits from these numbers, shift them, convert them back. And these could also go over byte boundaries, right? It's just a sequence of bits, so a code could start in one byte and span several bytes, end at another byte. This is kind of expensive, because when you're doing decompression, you want to have it really, really fast, and you want to avoid having codes going over byte boundaries. So here's a very simple scheme, which is actually also used for UTF-8, which will be, we will have a half a lecture about it, so it's actually practically very relevant. And here you use, each code has an integer number of bytes. And here's an example. So let's just take a number. I will just explain it by example. So, for example, I don't have any more text on this slide, no. For example, let's take x, let's take 537. Okay, let's first uh, 537 in binary. We need, and this is something to absolutely <coughs> so 
So how do we do it f f in binary? What's the largest power of two that's contained in 537? Hmm? The largest power of two that's... Uh, the largest power of two that's contained, it's 512, right? Okay, do we have... Uh, so 512 is contained. Let me write the binaries ones in. So let's, that's the, like the largest thing that's contained. A one here. So what have we uh, left now? If we divide five, I mean, there are many ways to convert numbers to binary. I'm just showing you one. So now I have like 25 left, right? From 512 to, is t uh, 256 contained? In th no, it's not contained. So I have a... I'm not sure that's the most efficient way to... 256, 128 is also not contained, 64 is not contained, 32, I have 25 left, and now comes 16. Okay, 16 is contained. I subtract 16 from 25, what remains is, I think, 9, so now I have 8. I subtracted one, four is not contained, two is not contained, one is contained. So is this correct? Let's just check it. So that corresponds to one, two, four, that corresponds to eight, that corresponds to 16, and that corresponds to 512, one, two, four, eight, six, two, two, six, five. <coughs> and is it correct? 16 plus eight is 24, plus one is 25, so 537. Okay, so this is uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Typical exam questions or oral exam questions. You have to pay attention that you, in a binary. And now the question is how do we write that? How many we want an integral number of bytes. How many bytes do we need? Is one byte enough? I don't think so. One byte is not enough. So two bytes are probably enough. So how would variable byte encoding do it? Would do it like this. Now I have to draw two bytes. That's how bytes look like in a computer. So if you Look at it with a microscope, it will look like it's no joke. You think I'm joking, but it's true. So I'm it's exactly how they look like. That's why they're so RAM is so expensive. So what you do, you have a particular bit at the beginning of the byte which just tells you is this a uh, so we have a two-byte sequence now, and in the rest we write the green number, and here we just say, okay, this is... Uh, <coughs> this, this says that it's the uh, last byte of the sequence. So you just use a particular number of bits in the beginning, to say whether it's the... And, and one means it's not the last byte of the sequence. So if you have several of them, and now you just put your, uh, your binary number here, so you just, let's just fill it up from the back, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero. So you just have seven bits for the information here, and now you continue here, we have two more zeros, zero, zero, one, and we can always write leading zeros there. So that's now the... And this is... Uh, yeah, so you have this uh, signaling bit in the beginning, so you're wasting one bit for every byte for just saying, okay, is the code uh, still continuing or does it end here? You have an integral number of bytes, and if you want to get what the number actually means, you have to extract these bits but you don't have to do bit fiddling now. Uh, you still have to do bit fiddling, but the next code will now start at a, at a byte boundary. And, and we will see this more in lecture seven. There's a question or comment? Do you know uh, if you're doing by the last 
Can you say it again? If ah, the question is whether it's this way round or that way round. I think it's up to you. I don't think it's defined in a way. For for UTF-8, it will be the signaling will be a little more complicated. It will be sequences of bits in the beginning. Actually, for UTF-8, we will see that we have a sequence like one 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 zero in the, in the first byte, which tells you okay, the whole thing will be three bytes long or something. So this is just one way of signaling using the first bit, and it's just convention for your coding scheme. But it's not that there is the variable byte encoding. There are several ways to do it, and that's just one way to do it. Any question about this scheme? So we have now seen. Oh, there's another. Yeah. So this scheme can this be used with all the previous codes that we've seen so far to like optimize them, or would that break that in some way? So the question is, can it be combined with the previous ones? I mean, you could combine it by just taking this number here and encoding it with Elias Gamma and writing it here, but why, why would you do that? I mean, the, the binary representation is the most compact way to write a number, right? It's the shortest way to write a number. This has log 2x length. If you take any of the other schemes, they are, they are longer. The problem with binary is that it's uh, not prefix-free. If you just concatenate binary and go from left to right, you can't decode. So this is another way of making it unambiguous by introducing these uh, bits in the beginning. Why yes? Why don't we use a flag sequence and bit stuffing? Why don't we use a? Why don't we use a? Why don't we use a? So you want an unambiguous bit sequence which says this is the beginning, this is the end, which you then don't use in any of the codes. But if it's part of the code, then we have to use bit stuffing that we uh, add additional ones and we have to remove them. In the yeah, so you, you, the suggestion is why not have a pattern for the beginning and the start and then you avoid this pattern in your code somehow. Can be done and, and I'm certain there are codes which do that. The question is, is it which one is the best, right? So it's, it's another idea to create a code, and there are so many ideas to create codes. The question is just which one, which one is the best. So yes, can be done. There are no limits on, on, on creating codes. And let me just, and the whole uh, remaining half of the lecture is about which one is best for which application. So, yeah, there's this huge variety. So you always have to ask, I mean, there are these three dimensions of a code. How much does it actually reduce? I mean, you can come up with codes and they are extremely wasteful. So I think with these patterns, you have to pay attention not to waste too many bits. Then there is the speed. How fast does it compress? And then there is how fast does it decompress. So for example, you, all of you probably know gzip and bzip or bzip2. gzip is like pretty fast in both directions. bzip compresses a little bit more, but takes super long to compress. But it depends on the application. Maybe you have an application where it doesn't matter if it takes 10 hours to compress your file, because you're just providing it for download. You don't care. You just want it to be as small as possible and then it should be reasonably fast to decompress. So there's this whole spectrum here, different trade-offs. Of course, you can't have all of them optimal. You have to make some trade-offs. If you are interested in, in beautiful mathematical schemes, here's just one example from the huge variety. That's a particularly nice one. I, I would need a whole lecture to explain it here because it uses mathematics. Actually, what it does is it takes a whole message, not just the individual singles, and encodes a whole message in one big number somehow, and it does it with mathematics. And the nice thing about this one, you know the nicest mathematics is always where the mathematics behind it is pretty complicated, but when you use it in practice, it's a super easy algorithm. So if you don't want to understand it, just use it. It's actually pretty easy. 
And it's used in practice to this day. So for example, Facebook's compression library is, I think that's also where it was invented. And it's a relatively recent invention, which is also interesting. So compression, this has been uh, researched since 1940 or something, and still in 2014, somebody comes up with a new scheme. And I think you can come up with new schemes. There is just a very rich world and very fascinating. So there's a Wikipedia article on this, and it's very nice, not so easy to understand. Okay, so the second half of the lecture is about the question, so when do we use which uh, scheme? And before that, we will make a five-minute break. So let's continue with the second half, and it's 11 slides, and that's it. <coughs> so what's the motivation? I already mentioned it. So which code... Which do we take? We saw several, well, some even had parameters. Each parameter gives you different codes, so many other ideas. Well, as usual, the answer for that such questions is it depends. The question is on what? On what does it depend? Well, if you think about it, it depends on your distribution of symbols, right? So, for example, in natural language, you come decompress, uh, you want to encode natural language, an E is much more frequent than a Z, let's say you want to encode individual letters, then you want to give E a shorter code than Z. But it somehow depends, if all the letters are equally likely, you will choose a different code. And by the way, if everything is equally likely, then binary representation of a fixed length is the optimal scheme. Think about it. And so, now we are trying to make this more precise, and this is actually what gave rise to coding theory 80 years back or so. And we will see some very, very beautiful and, and fascinating theory. <coughs> we need a few, little bit of mathematics, so that's kind of our <coughs> arithmetic operations from my earlier analogy. <coughs> So we need to define the entropy. So now you have some m different things. So let's always think of the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, something. And uh, now we have a random number from this range, like from the first m integers. And each of them has a certain probability to be picked. And now we can define the entropy of this distribution. The entropy of the distribution is a measure for how uniform or non-uniform is it. And let's actually use the uh, uniform distribution as an example. Let's, let's say every of the M symbols is equally likely. <coughs> and let's just compute the entropy in that case. Let's do it up here. So if each symbol is equally likely, the question is, of course, why does it have why is it sum over pi log 2 pi? If you, at the end of the lecture, it will become clearer because this will be a recurring scheme. At first, it looks a bit arbitrary, but you will see that there is a good reason for this. So let's just do it. If the pi are all m, then we have sum from 1 to m, and then a pi is 1 over m times, and now we have log 2 of 1 over m. <coughs> and there is a minus here, which shouldn't be... Minus is important in mathematics, it's just a small line, but if you think of your bank account, it makes a big difference. It does, so there's a minus in front of it or not. So yeah, sorry for adding this... <coughs> And so what is this? It's, uh, it doesn't depend on i, so it's m times something 1 over m, so it's just uh, minus log 2, 1 over m. And log 2 of 1 over something is just a negative of this, so the minus goes away. It's log 2 of m, which is uh, what's claimed down here. And this is actually where the entropy has its maximum here. If you go away from the, uh, from the uniform dist uh, distribution, 
uh, then the entropy becomes smaller. So this is like uh, chaos, everything can happen and if you have more structure, one symbol is more frequent than another, then the entropy, the chaos becomes smaller. Yeah. But yeah, let's just accept the names for now. And this is what I mentioned earlier, so if I'm not proving it now, but think about it. If all symbols are equally likely, then it's actually best to just use a fixed length encoding. You just take log 2m bits, you have to round it up. If m is not a power of 2, and you just encode everything with a binary encoding, and you pair it with zeros. If you have a fixed length, then uh, unambiguous encoding is also not a problem, because the length is just fixed. Okay. <coughs> so. Here's a very beautiful theorem from 1948, which gave rise to so much theory and many fields. It's by Claude uh, Shannon. You can read up on him. Very interesting guy with a very interesting life story. And here's the theorem, and it's very beautiful. You have a random variable with finite range. Think of some symbols, numbers from 1 to m. You want to encode them. And now you have a code. And this code has certain so code length. It uses the code length L1 for number 1, L2 for number 2. That's just our, what our L's are. For the rest of the lecture, they are the code length. And now, why did we, why did we uh, define the entropy? It looked arbitrary. Shannon's theory says you can think about it as long as you want no code length if you take the expected code length, which means expected, it's kind of the average, so you now have all your symbols, you always encode the A with this code, the B with this code, the C with this code, and now you get an average code length. And then some symbols appear more than others, so that's why the expectation, we will see in a second. And then this average cannot get better than the entropy. Like the entropy of the distribution is a lower bound for how well you can encode. That's why entropy is such a central measure. So that's the one side of the theorem. And now the other question is, okay, I can't get better than that. Can I get as good as that? And yes, that's, these are always the most beautiful theorems which tell you you can't be better than this, but you can always make it. And you can always make it up to plus one, which is, looks strange. Why plus one? Can we also do it without the plus one? There's actually a very nice reason, we would see it in a few slides, where this plus one comes from. And you have to look at the proof. So, so in words, you can't do better than the entropy, and you can always, if you have a given distribution, which you want to encode, then you can always achieve entropy with the right code. And we are now going to prove both directions, We're not doing the full proofs. Some of the proof will be delegated to the lectures, uh, to the exercise, which is a great way to exercise some math and also to understand this whole thing. And if I'm just doing the whole proofs for you, it's just entertainment. To learn something, you have to do it yourself. So here's a, here's a central uh, lemma, and it says, I have code length, and uh, these code lengths satisfy this property, and you will see why this property is a reasonable property. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry, there are two directions of this lemma. If you have a certain code, then this code length will satisfy this property. And if code length satisfy this property, then you can find a code with these code lengths. So this property is kind of central, it says, and it's known as Crufts inequality. So let's try to understand this. What does it mean? 2 to the minus Li, and if I sum this up, this has to be less or equal uh, to, to 1. Here's an example. Let's assume I have three code lengths and they are all 1. I mean, then I have 2 to the minus 1, plus 2 to the minus 1, plus 2 to the minus 1, and maybe more code length. So it's 1 half plus 1 half plus 1 half, and I'm already larger than 1. So this cannot happen. I can't have three codes. And think about it. What does it mean? I, I, ha I want three symbols for which I want, I want to encode them with just one bit. 
this cannot work, right? I mean, if I, I, if I have two symbols, I can give one the bit zero and the other one the bit one, and now I'm done if, I, if I'm prefix free coding, because now I can't have any other codes, because zero and one are given away. <laughs> <coughs> and it makes sense. So I have, uh, now I have two code lengths, one and one. One half plus one half is one. Uh, so I can't have any more codes. And this is the deeper reason of this inequality. Okay, now let's just try to prove these two directions partly and understand a little more. So let's assume we have code length like this. And now we want to construct a code with this code. And so now it's about constructing a code given some uh, code length. No, I think I'm... No, it's the other direction. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm confusing you. Now it's the first... I am sorry, just forget what I just said. This is... I have a code. No, the other direction will be constructing one. If it's prefix-free, then this holds, then not all the lengths can be one. Here's a nice mathematical argument, so it's just one slide, so focus for a second. Let's, how do we prove this? So we are now given some code, we know it's prefix-free, and then this inequality is supposed to hold. Why is that? So let's assume we generate a binary a bit sequence at random. Pick a zero, a one, a zero. So let me just do this. So we just consider this algorithm. So I'm just doing the following. Zero, one, one, zero, zero, one. This is my algorithm and I'm just doing this at random. And now, when do I stop? I stop when I have a valid code or when there is no code left that starts with what I've already generated. So either at some point this is a code, maybe this is a code in my encoding, or there can be no more code. And this is well defined for a prefix-free code, right? Either it would not be well defined for a not prefix-free code, because then I wouldn't have to know, wouldn't know whether I can stop here or whether I should continue, because Maybe this is already a code, but there's already also a code starting with this. So I should uh, somehow mark this here. So this is well defined because it's a well defined procedure for prefix free codes. Yeah, when the code is prefix-free is probably a better way to say this. Is prefix-free. Then I'm either the prefix of a code that will uh, still come into existence, or I can say no more code with that prefix. So now let's denote this event that by this procedure I generate some code, and let's call that CI. Then by the way this procedure goes, uh, either I will generate this code or that code. So the CI are independent, they can't happen both at the same time, which means uh, this here holds if uh, random variables are independent. Then this holds, this equality holds. Then if you have uh, the probability that one of them happens, it's just the, the sum of the probability that, of that each of one. Uh, of the individual probabilities. That's just the definition of independence. And if you look at the probability of generating a particular code, what's the probability of generating a particular code? Let's say, and I'm picking each bit of random, what's the probability of generating this code up here? Let's say that is a code. I'm generating each bit at random and I stop when I have the code. What's the probability of generating this code?
Yeah? Yeah? One half? Multiplied six times. Yeah, one half multiplied six times. That's exactly right. So it's, uh, yeah, you have to get the first bit right. You have to get the second bit right. And you have to get the, and you have to do that uh, Li times, so as many times as you have uh, bits in the code. <laughs> and this is just 2 to the minus Li. And that's where this number comes from, 2 to minus Li. So it's just the probability of seeing that code if you uh, generate it at random. And, and here, if I just plug this in, then I just have the sum of the 2 to the minus Li less or equal uh, a 1. Okay. I think you have to look at this uh, yourself to really understand the code. I think the main takeaway from that slide is how this number comes to pass, this 2 to the minus Li. So it has a natural origin. Here's something that's uh, easier to understand. It's the other direction. Yeah, you have a question, of course. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. It's a very good comment, which actually I uh, in question, which I also had when I. That's just how it's used. So code, and actually on this very slide, I'm using both usages. This is the whole encoding. Like, I have a whole scheme, like Gollum encoding with a modulus 16, which assigns this code to number 1, this code to number 2, and so on. And then there's a particular code. So you could call the whole thing encoding scheme. And usually it's uh, clear from the context. So when I say prefix-free code, I mean the whole encoding scheme. If I say ith code, I mean the code for number i. And let me just make it very clear here by, so this means the whole, the whole encoding scheme. It's a very good question. And, and this means the particular code for a symbol i, whatever my symbols are. But yeah, that's also yeah how it's used in the literature and I yeah but maybe it would be cleaner. But that does it clean it up? No, yeah, go on. Oh, no, no, I think, okay, I think I see where the misunderstanding is. This is just, this is just uh, an algorithm for proving something. It's just a thought experiment. That's the whole thing. This is just a vehicle for doing this proof. It's not an encoding scheme or something. Okay. This is just, just, just accept that we're doing this algorithm. We're generating one bit at a time. It's a random experiment we are doing, and then at some point you will see a code, or you know that there is no code which starts like this. It's just a random experiment we are doing, and the purpose of the random experiment is that we can now set up this uh, inequality here. And we just use it to prove this. That's the whole point of this. It's not an algorithm which you use for encoding or something. It's just a, a thought experiment, a random experiment to prove this property here. <coughs> C1 is an event. 
That's the event that something happens in my random experiment. <coughs> so my, I'm doing, let me maybe say this again, I'm making a random experiment and this random experiment has a number of outcomes. So one problem, or events. So one event that can happen is that I generate this code, that I generate the code for number one. Another event is that I generate the code for number 17. Another event is that I don't generate any code at all. This is why it's not equal to one here. That can also happen. There are some bit sequences arising that don't lead to any code at all. And the whole purpose of this experiment is that I can... I think the proof is a bit tricky because it's kind of using a trick to, to prove something that maybe confuses you. Okay, yeah, I see the confusion. This is not the probability how it occurs in the data, it's just the probability in this random experiment. Okay. It's just, I'm just setting up a random experiment to prove something, to make an argument. It's just a vehicle for the proof. It's not about how frequent the symbol occurs in my data or anything. It's just it's like saying, let's play this game and let's see where this leads us. So we're just playing the game, pick one bit after the other, each with probability one half, and let's see what, what property does this game have. And then we can use this to prove this. It doesn't have anything to do with how frequent these things are in my... Okay, but I un understand the confusion, I will consider this for when I explain this the next time. And maybe we can continue this, this offline if there are still doubts. Yes? Uh, yeah, I have a question regarding the word independent. Uh, isn't it a little bit unlucky chosen? Because it doesn't refer to the probability of independence, but rather to mutual exclusiveness. I hope that it's the independence of the probabilities, because otherwise the proof would be wrong. And that's true, right? Yeah, that's true, but that's not probability independence. Yeah, I'm also a thing. Yeah, I thought about this before. So the uh, the uh, the comment was that it's what we are needing here is not independence, but. Uh, <coughs> Actually, I thought about it before. I mean, yeah, there's mathematical independence, which means uh, yeah, x conditional on y is times y, probability of y is... I mean, there are certainly disjoint events, if you think of them as a sub... Now that you say it, I think you are. Uh, I think you are right, but we should uh, we should clear this up afterwards because I thought about it and I thought there is a relation to independence. So sorry if this is not correct. So let me just and and thank you very much for pointing this out. Really, independence. Or, or just mutually. Okay, let's maybe leave it at that and clear it up afterwards. I have a feeling that you're right, but since I thought about it and, and then decided to write this, but maybe it was just too late in the night. So let's continue. So this is the more involved but easier direction. And thank you very much for paying attention, asking these questions. Now the other direction is, so here it says, uh, 
if we have a code, then the code lengths have a certain property. Now it's, I give you code length with a certain property, now I can always construct a code with these lengths. That's interesting. And let's, uh, let's do it with an example. Let's pick these code lengths. Let's say we want one, and, and the, what the lemma states is it can always be done. So I can choose, I say I want a code where one code has length one, the other code has length, another code has length two, and then there are two codes which both have length three. And now we first have to verify that uh, Crafts inequality satisfied, which is this. No, it's not Li, it's 2 to the Li, and let's just verify that it's satisfied, and it will be 2 to the minus Li, and this is now 2 to the minus 1, plus, and I think I can just write it like fractions, then it's easier to see. So it's uh, 1 half, 2 to the minus 1, 2 to the minus 2 is 1 fourth, plus 1 over 8, plus 1 over 8, and this is 1. <coughs> so now the lemma says, okay, 1, 2, 3, 3 satisfies this inequality. There is a code which with these code lengths. How do we construct it? And now I give you a construction scheme which does this. And, and here's the math, and if we will... I will just show it to you by example, as usual. I think that's the best way to understand it. <coughs> so here I have, so there's one thing that's called the M. So let's write it here. The M is the max code length here in my, for my I, and my max code length here is three. So I have three bits. So what I will draw, I will draw a binary tree a complete binary tree. And let me try my best to draw a complete binary tree of depth. A nice one, I hope. <coughs> and now, so that's a complete binary tree of depth two. I think it's not bad. <coughs> So, mm -hmm. and now <coughs> could be more symmetrical, and I, but I think it's okay. Each left edge gets a zero, and each and our codes, I think, were always oh, okay. I don't know. What do I? I want to give colors to things. No, I think I will just write. So the left one always gets zero. This gets the number one, zero, one. 0, 1, 0, 1. And the point is that each path from the root, so this is my root here, to one of the leaves, so here I have the leaves, gives me a code. Or I can stop somewhere in the middle. I also get a code. <coughs> and now, consider the code length. I showed you uh, all the contents already in sorted order, smallest first. So I s start with code length 1. Now I want a code of length 1. So now I pick a subtree and let's uh, give this our first color and let's maybe start with red. So red is, so I have L1 is uh, equal to 1. So I pick a subtree with 2 to the uh, 3 minus 1 leaves, 2 to the 3 minus 1 is uh, 4. <coughs> so what I do, I will just pick a subtree of size, so I will go here, and I will stop here. So I will just take, the, the whole tree is still free now, I will just, I could also go in the right direction, let me go left here, and I stop when my subtree has this size. And these are always powers of two, so it always works. So now I have a, this is a subtree of size, uh, and I will not draw all the subtrees like this. Subtree of size four. 
And now this will be my code. The code will just be the path until I hit my subtree. So the code is just zero. And this part of the tree is now gone. I can't use it anymore. And now you can maybe already imagine how it goes on. Let's take what's our next color. I don't know. Let's start. continue with green. So now I want green. I mean, this is not a proof now, but maybe you can imagine how it works. So it has code length 2. So this 2 to the m minus 2 to the 3 minus 2 is 2. Now I want to pick a subtree of length 2 from what's still left. And because these numbers, if you sum them up, if you sum up these 2 to the m minus le, so what I want to pick for each code, I get this here, and it's less than uh, 2 to the m, which is exactly the number of leaves in my tree. So here it has 8 leaves, 2 to the 3, by the way, by construction. Uh, that's why it works. So now, uh, that's why I always have something left. So let's just say, and now, just for the fun of it, I don't have to go left, I can also go right here. And this is now my subtree of size 2. And my code is the edges I went along here. The edges are 1, 1. And you also see I'm getting a prefix free code because I'm as always going in a part of the tree I haven't seen before. And see how it all works out? I still need a uh, I still need two codes of length 3, and I still have two paths of length 3 left, so it's actually very nice. Let's take a lila, it's a beautiful color, so now we have a L3 equals to a 3. So now we want to pick a subtree of size 2 to the 3 minus 3, 1, which is just a leaf. So we can just pick one of the remaining paths here, and let's maybe pick that one, so that's this subtree, and that corresponds to the code 100100. Zero, zero, one, zero, zero. And I hope it's, yeah, it should be clear, but the, w the way these paths are chosen, because they lead to disjoint subtrees, it's just equivalent to a prefix free. If you take any two of them, because the subtrees are disjoint, the uh, codes, none of the codes are a prefix of another. A code being a prefix of another would mean here that this one subtree is a subset of the other. And now we need a fourth color, that's the biggest problem of this encoding, I think, is picking four different colors. I think uh, I will try orange, I don't know, orange. Do you have a better color here? Maybe this, this nice blue here. Yeah, this is okay. It's another one, three. So we need one more path, which lead to a subtree of size 1, and there's just one left, and it's this one, this one, this one, and it has the code 101. One. And this scheme, you just uh, we just constructed this uh, whole algorithm of constructing a scheme, is called uh, this is called Huffman encoding. Writing down here is hard. This is called, and the hardest part about Huffman encoding is how to spell Huffman with how many F's and how many N's. That's also a popular exam question. Encoding, I'm sorry, it's uh, Huffman. There's a guy called Huffman. It's hard to write at the bottom. Any questions about this scheme? It's a beautiful scheme, and it works for, and I have to underline this above. And you can also imagine implementing this, right? You don't have to draw a tree for that, but that would also be a nice exercise. So you're given these four lengths, and now you should, and you can do it for any length. And you can also see, you get more intuition now why this inequality makes sense. This inequality is exactly the reason why you can pick sub one subtree after the other and there's still enough of the whole binary tree left. Any questions? Now we are kind of at the peak of complexity, now it becomes easier. Now we have proven the central lemma, now we can prove the source coding uh, theorem. Now we want to show 
We have any encoding expected code length. You can't get better than the entropy. So, so what does it mean? Expected code length. Our symbols have a certain distribution now. This is the distribution probability of symbol i is p i. The p i sum to one. Let me just write that here. So some probability distribution, so the pi always sum to one. And now, uh, so by Crafts inequality, we have shown that for any prefix-free encoding, we have this property on the code length. And now, this thing here, you want to show it's at least something. And now this is again Lagrangian multipliers, and it's exercise one of the fourth exercise sheet to show that this thing now becomes smallest if uh, all the code lengths are equal, namely log 2 of 1 over pi. That's how it becomes smallest. So if, uh, yeah, and this is uh, this exercise, and we can just uh, plug it in now. Actually, I already did it for you here, so with no writing here. So if the Li are all equal, log 2, 1 over pi, then this becomes smallest, which is why you have this here, because of the Lagrange. So this is the smallest possible value, and that's just the definition of the entropy. And here you get intuition of why the entropy is defined that way, because it just comes out here as the minimum value of, this, of the expected code length. So, that's the, so we actually get it for yeah, get it for free from what we have. Not, not for free, you have to show this Lagrange. So this is the one direction. <coughs> the other direction, a little bit more to show. You can always achieve entropy plus one, and now we will see why the plus one. It's a very simple reason. So, we want to achieve a, a curt so now the let, just to clarify now, uh, the pi are given, and we want to find we want to find a good code. So it's just that it's clear in which direction we are going. We are given a certain distribution which determines the entropy, and now we want to find a good code for that uh, distribution. And let's, now I'm just saying, well, we have seen this log to 1 over pi, let's just pick our code length like this. Now we have to decide, do we round up or round down? I claim we have to round up. Why? Well, uh, we have to satisfy Crafts inequality, and let's just do it here, sum i. I don't specify the range here, so I just leave it open like this. 2 to the minus, and if we plug this in, round it up, log 2 of 1 over pi. So now it's minus round it up, and uh, round it up of x is greater or equal to x, of course, and it's here with a minus, so this is less or equal than if we just drop the rounding up. 2 to the minus log 2, and now I'm getting close to the border. And this is, uh, oh my, do I have, yeah, I have some space here. And this is equal to minus of log 2 is 2 to the log 2 of pi, and 2 to the log 2 of pi, do I still have space here? Yes, I do. It's just sum i over pi, 2 to the log 2 of pi, and this is just 1. And this only works if I, uh, oh, my mouse disappeared. This just works if I round up, right? If I wouldn't round up, I wouldn't have less or equal here, I wouldn't satisfy Crafts inequality. So rounding down does not work. I have to round up here, that's important. And then I get to one. So, and what, uh, yeah, that's uh, written here, what I've just proven. So, now I've just said, let's try these code lengths. 
And now there is an encoding with these code lengths. We have just seen how to construct something like this. And now, by the definition, expectation is this, so it's just pi times li. And now let's just look at what the expectation is for this particular code length. So this is now, and I hope there's nothing more written here, that's correct. Sum i, so it's now the expected code length, symbol i with probability li, and it has this code length, log 2 of 1 over pi. I had to round up, otherwise Kraft's inequality would not hold. So this is, uh, now I want to upper bound it. I want to say this is not more than something. If I round something up, it can increase by at most one compared to the not rounded up number, right? Not even a full one, it's strictly less than even. So this here is less or equal than, well, I have some i, pi, without the rounding up, log 2, 1 over pi, and I have just the sum pi again. So if I just put this in parentheses, pi times this, and pi times 1 is this, well, and the nice thing is that, yeah, this here is exactly the entropy. That's how we define entropy. So you always have entropy, and this is just 1. <coughs> and this is where you have the plus 1. The plus 1 comes from the fact that you have an ideal code length according to the definition, but the ideal is uh, not an integer. And you have to round it somehow, and you have to round it up, Otherwise, uh, Kraft's inequality doesn't hold, but by the rounding up, you lose this plus one here. But it's nice that it's just a plus one and a not plus number of symbols, because what you sum up here is number of uh, the probabilities. So to really understand it, you have to do it uh, yourself, of course, but I think you've got a lot of intuition here. And now just some hints for the exercise sheet, and then we are done. The exercise sheet will be, well, one of them will be to do this Lagrange, we have already seen it. The other will be, oh, can we close the door for, it's just a few more minutes, then we are done. It's the last slide. So we have kind of seen that this is, if you are given a distribution, then the best code length is log 2 of 1 over pi, for the reasons we have seen. And uh, so, and now we are given a certain code, we want to know, okay, for which distribution is this a good code? And it's a good code if this inequality here holds. Yeah, because then uh, the expected code length is just the entropy plus 1, we have shown that. So if you have a, a code with, yeah, you have symbols with this distribution, you have this code length, then it's a good code length for that distribution by what we have shown. So to just say that again, a code, if a code is entry, entropy optimal for a distribution, the expected code length is, is optimal. Okay, so you have to prove that, and I will show it for one example, and you have to show it for another encoding uh, uh, for the exercise sheet. So, you have to prove this inequality here with a plus one for the exercise sheet. We make it a bit simpler. You can prove plus five or plus whatever makes it easiest for you. In computer science, <laughs> we always write constants to make things easier. And here's, so let's ask this question, Elias Gamma, for which probability distribution is it a good encoding? It's not always a good encoding, but there's always one probability distribution, several, but at least one for which it's a great encoding. Well, how do we answer that question? This is the code length of Elias Gamma. We have seen that you encode number i and you get something 2 log i. If you remember it from the beginning, it's like the prefix which says how many bits and then comes the binary representation of the number which is log 2 again. And the prefix is also log 2 and then you have a plus 1 because that's what came out of it. 
So now we want to find the distribution such that, well, this, yeah, this is what was written on the previous slide, that this Li is less than log 2, 1 over Pi plus 1, which means, oh, how did I do that? You want to find, so that's the question you are asking here. I want to find a Pi such that this holds. And actually for the exercise sheet it's easier, we're already giving you something and you just have to prove it, but here I'm showing you if you don't know the distribution already how you would do it. Now if you look at it, I don't know, do you have an idea what, what Pi would you choose such that this inequality holds 2 log i is less or equal than log 2 1 over Pi? Probably need a bit of experience with computing with logarithms and so on. So if you just take a equality here, what, what would come out for Pi? Ignore the rounding and take equality here. What, what would be a good Pi? You can also write it in the chat. If you want this to be equal to that. Let me, yeah. Let let me just write it here. Let's just forget about all the log 2i and let's say we want to make it equal and then we can see how. What's pi so that this holds? Yeah? What one? one over i squared, that's correct. Yeah, if you do one over i squared, let's just do it here. And now so that it's an inequality, uh, it has to be, to find my pointer again, it has to be greater or equal, let's just do the math here. So if pi is greater or equal to one over i squared, let's just ignore i equals one for a second, then 2 to the rounded down log 2ai is less or equal if you ignore the rounded down, rounding down only makes it smaller, log 2 of i is log 2 of i squared, and that's log 2 of 1 over pi. So yeah, 1 over i squared is the probability distribution, and, uh, and this also holds for, for i equal to 1, you can choose p1 as you like, uh, because for i equals to 1, uh, log 2 of i is 0. <laughs> so the left side will always be smaller, no matter which pi you pick here. Okay, so we're just looking for pi 1 over i square, and, and we can choose p un, p1 as we like. Here's, I could talk, it's a very nice proof to show what's the sum of the 1 over i square it actually converges, 1 over i does not converge, the infinite sum, 1 over i square does converge, and strangely enough, you have pi here, pi square. Why does pi square occur when you uh, sum up the reciprocals of the squares? It's, it's a really nice proof, I could give it to you, but no time, unfortunately. Uh, but you see that it's a number larger than 1, but not larger than 2, which means if you remove the first one, which is 1, you get 0 0.6449, and so you just take p1 equals to uh, 1 minus 6441. So, uh, yeah, you just take, uh, I can write that here, so p1 you just define it as 1 minus 0 0.6449, and then you get a probability distribution and yeah, you can say that Elias gamma is uh, entropy optimal for that probability distribution. And for, uh, for the exercise sheets, so now, and now it comes back to the beginning of the lecture, so this is what you will do for the exercise sheet. If you do a gap encoding, then you get small numbers and larger numbers, but the smaller numbers are much more frequent, and actually the numbers will have this distribution here, 1 minus p over i minus 1 times p, so that's, uh, 
<coughs> that's the distribution you uh, get. And for that kind of distribution with a certain p, where p depends on the length of the inverted list here, uh, Gollum encoding is the best one. So that's a, a really nice result and you will prove it for, for the exercise sheet. So you have gap encoding, then the gaps, assuming that the uh, IDs in the list are somehow randomly distributed, which they are not, but it's a good reasonable assumption. Then the best encoding is Gollum encoding and you can even say exactly for which modulus. So the mathematics here does not even tell you the right encoding but also the right parameter and this is this exercise. Let me just mention that in practice you would probably use a variant of Gollum encoding because Gollum encoding is one of these schemes where uh, what the codes can go across byte boundaries, but so in practice you will always choose codes which uh, pay attention to byte boundaries, but you can always make variations of codes which do that, so it's still useful theory. Any question about this last part, entropy optimality? That's what the exercise sheet will be about, and also another Lagrange. I think it's easier than the last sheet. The next sheet will be practical again, but use the occasion to brush up your math. <coughs> and there will be a Q&A, maybe Q&A session on Friday is a misnomer because it will be a session where you can also get explanations again or yeah, anything can happen. I don't know if you have uh, suggestions for how this session should be organized, please let us know. And if, if you're one of the 20% who said you want help, you should definitely come to the session on Friday because I, there are several people there. We have breakout rooms, so you can also go to a room with someone and get just explanations just for you if, if there are individual problems, so we can accommodate that. <coughs> Any questions for now? Okay, so that's it. Have fun with the sheet. See you in one week. Bye-bye.